Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jess Khaleesi, and I am the Partnerships and Events Manager for DASA. And today, I am very excited to welcome you to our second episode of our Experience Management mini-series, uh, Enhancing Experience Management for Better Business Outcomes. I am delighted delighted to introduce you to our speaker for today's episode. Uh, I would like to welcome Alan Nance, Vice President uh, Experience Advocacy at the XLA Institute as our distinguished guest today. Alan is also involved as the lead author in developing the DASA Experience Management Product Suite. So we are very excited to have such a brilliant uh, advocate of experience, manager, experience management uh, as our speaker today. Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you. So yeah, hi everybody. Um, it's great to share this uh, conversation with you um, about enhancing experience management for better business uh, outcomes. Um, so what are we gonna talk about today? First of all, I think it's very important that we do a sort of quick level set about what is the essence of experience management? Then I'd like to talk a little bit about what is the influence that developers have on experience management and why is that changing and why is it very important? And then lastly, I'd like to talk about the effect that experience management actually has on developers uh, because that's a, uh, that's a big theme these days. Developer experience is something that we should all be concerned about because we have some challenges there uh, to overcome. So what is the essence of experience management? Well, here's what I want you to believe. I want you to believe that you are the guardian of the human experience of digital products and that understanding and designing experience is an explicit part. Helen, I don't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I think you, the presentation isn't uh, on display mode yet. Oh, well, it is here. Oh, it was in mine. So hang on. Ah, OK. Let's. Let me see. No okay, problem. Let me, let, me, let me start again. Otherwise, I thought no it was. But, hmm, that's weird. Okay. I know. It just worked. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. Okay. So tell me if it is now. No. Nope. All right. Uh, we've added your screen. Um, can you press? try pressing display again or exiting out? Oh, oh, oh. Um, hang on, I'm getting a, an error message here from StreamYard. What do you one second? Uh, all new for me. Share screen. Go to the window. That's where it is. <laughs> and then, bang! It should come up. Is it not coming up? It's coming. It's in the. It's in the like uh, edit mode. So if you also maybe try start presentation because you are sharing your screen. No, I, I am doing that. Fine. So. Yeah, so let's try something else. I don't know. Let's make it this way. Let's get rid of that. Is that better? Yeah. Because oh, maybe maybe that's what I'm going to have to do. Because I don't. Because I don't. Because look, when I when I do this, it's not coming up. No, that's weird. It did come up during our uh, our tech run. So I think maybe. It's now, now it doesn't want to work once we're live. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's isn't that, isn't that the way? Okay, so. <laughs> right. So, so can you see this <laughs> anyway? So, so what I was saying, and we'll just see how we work through this. Maybe the animation won't work, but the messaging won't change. So what I want you to believe is that you are the guardian of the human experience of digital products, and therefore understanding and designing experience is going to be an explicit part of your role. And what I want you to know is there is a comprehensive set of education, training, methods, and techniques to help you on that journey. And what I want to hit the button next to slideshow, Dave's trying to help me out here. <laughs> yeah, I think, let's see. I don't oh, know what the button, oh, the button next to slideshow. Hang on one sec. There isn't a button next to slideshow, is there? Oh. Sometimes mm. the read mode too works, which is down at the bottom. Which one? If you okay. look at a little book next to 
So notes, if you go to the little book, this there one. we go. That usually is a nice, our little. Uh, okay, let's try this thing. Okay. Oh. Is this working? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. And so at, at the end of this, what I want you to do is to commit to becoming a contributor to the experience of your audience. So what is um, experience? What is experience? And I think I, I love this. It's a, it's a quote from, uh, uh, it's actually from a Mormon philosopher, Carl William Boner. And that people will forget what you said. They will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And this, in the essence, is the difference between an SLA and an XLA. So an SLA, service level agreement, is a lot about say what you do and do what you say. And historically, there's been very little space in service management to include how people feel about the service, the product, or you as they, as they go through that journey. Now, what's important here is how you make them feel is a memory. And it may not always be accurate. So memories are actually the hallmark of, of experience. And that's something just to hold on to as we move through this presentation. So essential experience concepts, and um, this is a, a slide uh, from, from Dave <laughs> that I've uh, borrowed because I think it gives a great overview in one go. We are mostly very good at looking at interactions in time. So the contact moment between a product or service and the audience. So an example is, you know, exposing the audience to new IT functionality. What's new or relatively new and more important when we get to experience management is experience over time, which is a collection of interactions, which parts are remembered together and these memories form an experience. So that's the overall experience your audience remembers with a product, with a service, or even with you. Now, within that experience over time, we deal with something called the peak end rule, which is human beings remember parts of a journey, and they allow hammocks to occur within the journey. So they remember the most positive, the most negative, and generally the last moments of an experience better than the other moments. So if we want to improve the experience over time, we need to understand those peaks and we need to really make sure that we end strongly and positively. An example here, an ice cream after checkout at a furniture store. But sometimes at the end of visiting a restaurant, you know, they'll give you something, a goodie bag or something to take with you. Uh, you see that a lot at, at seminars and events as well. Now, what's important when we're talking about cumulative moments over time is to remember that human beings build our perceptions of experiences like birds build nests. So they're from scraps and straws that we chance upon. It's not just in the moment that we're in. It's also what we've heard before, what we hear afterwards, what our friends recommend to us. So everybody's perception coming into an experience is probably slightly different. And so experience management is a scale proposition. It's not a psychological uh, proposition. It's basically a digital anthropological proposition that we're looking at. No, it's not. Oh, yeah. So here we are. Again, we have the transaction. We have moments over time. And experience is around the cumulative and multiple moments over time. Now, let me take you through a restaurant experience through the eyes of Gen Z. Um, my children are Gen Z. Maybe we're Gen Z on the line and, and you can validate or disagree with me. But when Gen Z goes to a restaurant, they generally, especially if there's a group, they don't walk down the street and say, hey, this looks fine. Generally, they have made a decision beforehand based on what influencers told them, what their friends have told them, what they see on Yelp. And they will have done research to say, here's where we're going this evening because. Now, when they get to that place, the first thing they're going to check on is the ambience. Does this look and feel like the expectation that we had? 
And the worst thing for Gen Z is even if it's the best restaurant in the world, it's empty. The best experience for Gen Z is a 15 to 20 minute wait, preferably with a SMS callback and a bustling environment. So they feel, OK, this is a great this is a good choice. We're going to we're going to continue our journey here. The next step is the wait staff. <laughs> How are we greeted? Now, this is culturally different. Uh, if you're in the United States, you expect somebody to come to you within five minutes. They're going to give you a menu. They're going to offer you water and they're going to ask any immediate questions that you have. In other cultures, it could take a long time and, and somebody may not come at all until you get quite upset. Then we get to the menu. Now, the interesting thing about Gen Z is they've already read the menu. They're not like me, the, the Gen X and boomers, that we read the menu almost for the first time and then figure out what we like. They've already made their choice. They made that choice maybe even a week ago. And so here's another moment of truth. If the choice that was made is not available, especially if they're vegan or vegetarian, they probably exit the restaurant at this time. The next thing is the perception of the back of house. For Jen said, they're looking for an open kitchen, preferably that they can see people working. They can see the cleanliness. They can see the food being uh, freshly prepared. Then we have the meal. The meal, again, for, for Jen uh, Gen Z, not exclusively Gen Z, is more of a communion. Often we're sharing things. This is an Instagrammable moment that we're sharing. This is a moment that we actually describe the food that we're going to eat and what we think of it. Then we have the things around the food, things like the amenities. Now, as an older uh, Gen X boomer, I cannot deal with uh, restrooms that are not clean. So even if everything else has been perfect up to now, if the restroom is not up to scratch, I might leave at this point. For Gen Z, the amenities could be important because they could also be Instagrammable. If there's art in there, if there's something spectacularly uh, different in there, that can also be uh, an Instagrammable moment. The last point is the payment here. The payment is the moment that all of those preceding things add up. And the first question we ask here, was this a good use of our time? Was this the, the money value of time of this experience? How does it stack up with the bill? But the most important thing coming back to the peak end rule is the departure. This is the moment that this experience is starting to be sealed into the memory. The way people leave this restaurant and what they are saying is going to determine how this whole experience was remembered. Now, if we look at that, what we see is that the transaction performance is right at the bottom. Are we doing what we said we would and are we doing it well? And normally for every restaurant, you are going to see KPIs uh, for each of those interactions. How long it takes before somebody sees a, a waiter, how long it takes to get the food out, how often the, the, the amenities are clean. That's all part of the transaction performance. As we move to experience, we're actually interested in, are we doing what matters? And will people remember this experience as pleasurable? So we're getting a new set of methods, techniques, and things to consider. Now let's look at the developer influence on experience management. Because what has happened over time, in the older days, service design was part of service management. And there were people that looked at the business value processes and they were making their decisions on what was appropriate for a service. As that has moved more and more into developer communities, developers have become implicitly responsible for the experience of the products they create. So you're not just low coding, no coding, Python coding, you're actually assuming the, oh, sorry, the responsibility for the experience, especially in biz DevOps. If we look in biz DevOps, you are now the guardian of the human experience of digital products. And you can see it on the five things that determine uh, biz DevOps, driving better ROI, collaboration across teams, ensuring value across silos, integrating business priorities, and customer-centric development. 
So because developers are increasingly responsible for the experience, things they're going to have to look at things differently because when you look at things differently, the things you look at change. So if you accept my uh, proposition that you are now responsible for the experience, what does that mean? What do you now need to look at? So one of these things you need to consider is experience anticipation because people will adjust their experience perception based on their anticipation of that experience. And that generally falls out into four, four areas. One, brand expectation. What is the brand expectation of this restaurant, this product, this company? And, and you know, you may well have some type of brand design and that's the, the success of that brand design is going to uh, be determined by the authenticity as the audience sees it. So somebody who gets a new iPhone has very different expectations than somebody who gets a new Samsung. The next one is the individual expectations. What do I expect from this encounter, from this experience? The third is what are we promising them? What are we promising them in terms of a deliverable, a delivery date, a quality of a deliverable, when they can expect something? Uh, so if you're doing an onboarding experience, when, can, when are people expecting to get their next laptop? When are they expecting to have access to the system? And then the fourth one, which is probably the trickiest, is what we remember from similar situations. So if I did have a Samsung and I'm moving to an iPhone, I am going to bring all of my memories from the similar situations to that new encounter. If I move... If I have a Volvo, an old Volvo that I've had for five years and I'm buying a new Volvo, I will have expectations that are kind of based on what I expected from my old Volvo. So understanding these things are important. The most important thing that we're trying to find out in our, in our journey is experience anxiety. Ex experience anxiety is the worry that employees or customers feel when they think something negative might happen or worse they don't know what is going to happen so for instance if you would promised me you're going to get your your new laptop within three days as a new employee and it's day four i'm now starting to worry why didn't i not get the laptop am i going to get the laptop who should i talk to about the laptop and a big part of what we need to incorporate in our journeys is taking out the experience anxiety a great example of this is the uber map in the old days, if you ordered a taxi to go to the airport and you expected the taxi to come at 10 and it was five past 10, you had no idea where the taxi was. In fact, nobody had any idea where the taxi was. So now you're worrying about, should I call somebody? Should I call another taxi? Am I still going to make it to the airport? The Uber map essentially does one thing, and that is to reduce anxiety by telling you where the driver is and how far away they are. That's a great example of a developer coming up with something that reveals, that relieves experience anxiety. So normally when we do this, we, we manage the moments that matter uh, and we'll have a journey map that tells us what the content needs to be as we move along that journey. When we get to experience management, as I said earlier, we need to now include experience anticipation and we need to identify anywhere that there might be experience anxiety. Because if there is experience anxiety, people are not going to be moving along the journey as we intended. They could stop. They could end the journey. They could pause. Um, but there could be something just inhibiting them from moving from A to B that we need to resolve. And we do that by building an XLA stack. So the XLA is the experience level agreement. Normally, that's where you would insert it, <clears throat> where you have your experience ambition, and you measure how people feel through sentiment experience indicators. But you can also use your operation on technical data and your SLAs and KPIs to inform that. So if you have uh, a process that's in Salesforce and people are not moving along that process, you could see that in Salesforce. You don't need to ask them. You can see it. Oftentimes, we will have pop-up sentiment questions or we will have surveys uh, during and after the transaction.
Now I want to quickly move to the experience management influence on the developer because, you know, good developers are hard to find. They're expensive to train and you want to have them as effective as possible. And something scary is happening. We've, we are finding that 83% of developers are experiencing burnout and 58% of developers are experiencing cognitive overload. Now, when I worked at EY, our sole definition of developer experience was essentially the automated development chain. And the assumption was if we get that chain right, we will have good developer experience. And what we're finding now is that is not the case. In fact, um, uh, uh, research that's been done by Dora, but also by Google shows us that there are three big things we need to understand to optimize the developer experience. The flow state, the cognitive load, and feedback loops. And Dora, some of you may be aware, have created uh, the space concept to measure five things that they feel are good indicators of developer experience. So here's another place that you could use an experience level agreement. For instance, it could look like this, that our desired experience is we want to create an environment that enables employees, in this case, developers to thrive. And so the question is, does the development environment help you to perform to your best? And then you can drill down those sub questions like, does the flow of new technologies improve or hinder your ability to produce good results? How does instructional design affect your work? Do you feel like a successful developer most of the time? And then we can add metrics to that appropriate to the situation that we are in. So an overall view, when we look at service level agreements as we know them today, they're on the left-hand side. I'm not gonna read all these to you because you can read these faster than I can read them to you. But you see that certain Aspects are very different in this new situation. We are less about process and more about how people experience the outcomes. We're less about KPIs and more about the experience indicators on what they feel like. We're less worried about transactions and more worried about cumulative moments over time. And the other thing I would tell you is the last one that's very important, that Service level agreements tend to be very static. They tend to have, they tend to be unchanged for over 20 years. So many of the service levels that we work with today were invented before the iPhone, before the App Store. Whereas humans are self, uh, are self programming sensors. So they are always changing, which means that their experience is subject to the gravity to average. What they hear other people doing. If they get used to a certain experience, they're going to, over time, value it less. So there's much more turbulence in experience than there is in original designs around process. So the conclusion here is you're going to get involved in XLAs at some point. According to Gardner, 55% of organizations intend to impl implement XLAs as part of their experience management a program within three years, 19% plan to do so in the next 12 months. So this indicates a very significant trend towards adopting experience management and XLAs. And I'm very happy that DASA and the XLA Institute are working together to help you with the tools and the knowledge that you need to succeed on your journey. So that was my presentation. And now I'm very interested in any comments, questions, rotten tomatoes or whatever you want to bring up around that. Oh, no, that honestly, that was such an excellent, uh, excellent overview. Um, I know I have some questions before we get to our key takeaways. Uh, so while uh, we give the audience a chance to type some up, I wanted to quickly highlight, you know, Perhaps could you share some specific advantages for adopting experience thinking and experience management into a DevOps agile context? 
Well, I think the first thing is, um, especially in biz DevOps, you're looking at business outcomes. And, and the business outcomes at the end of the day are going to be affecting revenue, market share, repeat buying, uh, customer loyalty, things like that. But also even with employees, right? So just look at our dev developer experience. If we ensure that de developers are more productive, if we ensure that they're happier, we're going to have less attrition. We're going to have less people falling out of our system. That saves money as well. Um, so I think there's there's lots of really big business benefits here. You know, I recently I was uh, talking to uh, to a pension company, and they were looking at if we improve the experience of the um, of people onboarding uh, who are going to save for their pensions as individual contributors. Will they be more inclined to save? Will they make better investment decisions? And will they stay with the program longer, giving them ultimate benefits to their to their pensions at the end of the day? So these are examples where if you inject experience into the development experience and you start to measure those things, you start to get closer to the biz DevOps uh, objective of uh, business outcomes. Excellent. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, an, it's funny because I think we talk... Uh, incorporating biz devops it's almost not a, it's not a separate thing from everything else it's part of this ecosystem exactly. and you have to really embed in um embed these experiences to create uh just better better business outcomes not to name drop the title of the <laughs> the title of the webinar but excellent i'm checking to see if there's anything from linkedin but i do want to ask you you know yeah. quite quite selfishly um as also the lead um one of the lead authors you know being a lead author for das's product suite what do you consider uh usps of these talent and guidance products to help organizations and their leaders uh to build experience management capabilities into a digital product devops agile context well, I think up to now that we've we've defined digital products very much is as the digital products, right? So it, it's 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 coming. It's almost like that very old thing that people don't buy drills; uh, they want holes, you know. And and so when we look at the digital product, especially if you're taking some type of a, a user story or some sort of requirement, and you're 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 the the low code, no code person for that, it's very easy to obsess with the digital product without understanding whether the digital product's going to work or not, or whether it's accepted. I mean, a great example from one of our customers at ABN Amro is that something like moving uh, a certain button from left to right may make a lot of sense and may even make sense if you've done uh, Sue, you've applied Sue to it and a subjective user experience to it. And then it gets to the actual audience and the audience has muscle memory and they've been typing away for ages and now they can't find the button. And so the productivity of an entire organization goes downhill because you just move the button from left to right, even if it was all, you know, ethical or aesthetical, I should say, and it made sense and, and there was no indication on Sue that it would bother anybody, you've just suddenly killed the productivity of an entire department. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and I think the, the dangerous thing here, because, you know, I've worked with DevOps a long, long time with, with people like Gene Kim and Mick Gerst and all this, and I, I don't think that experience was ever explicitly mentioned. It's all been about MTTR and flow and 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 um, and technical debt and all of these things that really describe the process, but don't describe the business outcome of the process. And I think that's making that explicit is a huge thing. Yeah, and actually, I think that's a perfect segue into a question that just came in from the audience. Um, so Beecher just asked, you know, XLA is an additional dimension. Does it replace? SLA now that we're looking, you know, less at process. Uh, is it, I guess it's, it's like, do you look away from it or does it replace or is it actually part of this still? Well, I think in the beginning, there were certainly people that were calling, you know, SLA like secrets, lies, assumptions, and that, that this was going to replace it. I think uh, we've now learned that that is not the case. Um, because first of all, you need there are certain service levels that you need that have nothing to do with the experience, and you need them to run the run your own process. So we're not so those will always remain. 
What we are learning is that service levels now are the pillars understoning the bridge. I saw uh, uh, an article recently from Roman uh, from ISG that he he was saying, look, if I build a bridge, I need I need something underneath the bridge to hold it up. Those are really the SLAs. So, but what we are learning is the SLAs are changing. So the SLAs now have to modify to support the experience, but we're definitely not replacing service levels. We will have less. The service levels will become more volatile in some cases because the experience has a, short, a shorter life cycle. Uh, we also have XLAs that are project based. So for instance, uh, if you're doing a transition from one thing to another, you can do an XLA for that. You can do an XLA for a merger, an acquisition, a spin-off. So, it's, so the XLAs are much more flexible, and therefore the SLAs need to to adapt to that. But we're not going to replace them. Excellent. Oh, that's phenomenal. Because yeah, it's very much you still need that foundation. You still need the uh, yeah. the you know um, when you're talking about the bridge, all of the. I'm going to think the word. pillars, suspension, pillars, yeah. pillars, pillars, suspension, yeah. all of that. Right. But then it's. How do people get across? <laughs> how does right. it? How is the experience? Is it? Is it rickety? That's <laughs> where exactly. And is the bridge going anywhere? Right. I mean, that's, is that's... Is it, does it just lead you into a giant roundabout of traffic? Which well, you'll get that. You know, I live, I live in the United States, and you'd be surprised how many bridges go nowhere. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Especially in Miami. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> Suddenly, you're the bridge brings you just into another area of traffic, and you're. <laughs> Somehow still farther away from your destination. <laughs> indeed, indeed. But, uh, great. Well, we have um, one more question that just came in from the audience. Can we apply this concept in managed services project uh, and not just yeah. development ones? Oh, well, definitely. Uh, in fact, we within the XLA Institute, we have a sourcing chapter, which is entirely devoted to how procurement and sourcing people should include experience into their category management, into their RFPs, RFIs, uh, contracts, and vendor management. Because um, it, it's certainly in managed services, because I, and I, I don't have time to go into it, but we have specific models, especially for managed services, because the subjective experience is much more important than the uh, the logical experience that we have in, in service agreements. And when people succeed or fail in sourcing arrangements, managed services, it's really because they've missed the experience component. They fail to measure it. They fail to track it. They don't see the direction of travel. And especially if you start to drift into red sentiment, dark sentiment, it, it gets worse because the customers actually stop talking to you because the legal department says, don't talk to the supplier because we're going to put out another RFP. We don't want them taking their best people off of our project. Don't let them know that we're actually going to terminate uh, for cause or whatever. So, yes, absolutely, uh, Abdul Rahman, this is absolutely a concept in managed services. Excellent. Well, I think we're we're wrapping up for time, so uh, I'm going to throw up our uh, wonderful key takeaways um, document here, and I just want to give a huge, huge thank you, Alan, for your incredible insights on the not only the essence of experience management because I think we go into it; it's so broad. It, there's so much, you know, that you can look at, and we you really gave such a comprehensive look at um, the impact of it on business, but also um, on the developers. I really, I just love your quote that uh, it was, people will never forget what you, people will forget what you said, they will, will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Um, and I think as we look at experience management, you know, it's just far more complicated than uh, maybe just a survey response, but rather, this collection of moments over time by both the company itself, but also the informed backgrounds um, of the users, of your customers. So, and again, I love how you touched upon how the developer fits within this experience ecosystem. Not only is it the developer a huge influencer of the experience on the customer, but 
also the developer's experience is just as important in experience management to keep uh, and retain retain talent and grow uh, grow the talent you have um, and avoid burnout. So we would like to highlight some key takeaways from this episode, such as shifting focus from initial customer sentiment to lasting impressions um, to create uh, value, uh, focus on products that reduce uh, experience anxiety, um, and focus also on how to improve the experience of your customers as well as your developers. So if you were inspired by today's topic and want to learn more about experience management, we encourage you to check out the DASA Experience Management uh, Certification Program and Product Suite. You can find more about it on our website at dasa.org or access the direct link I've put in the comment section. Um, thank you all again for joining and thank you for our patience uh, with our technical issues at the beginning. That is the beauty of a live production. Um, our next episode will be on December 10th at four o'clock Central European time. The topic appropriately named and timed, Unlocking Developer Happiness, How Platform Engineering Powers Productivity and Innovation. Thank you all again for joining. And thank you again, Alan, for a wonderful session. You're welcome. Cheerio.